Good morning. So I had my keynote written about two weeks ago, but a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Everybody's asking a few questions. What's with all these new foundations? How do these technologies work together? So let's talk about that. Uh, it's become commonplace to say that we're at the dawn of a new era, right? We have supercomputers on our pockets. We use them to communicate via Twitter. Sometimes we even make phone calls with them. Right? We drive supercomputers down the highway. Unfortunately, they can be hacked, as we're finding out. As devices get cheaper, as screens get cheaper, as, compute, as networking and storage gets cheaper and wireless access gets ubiquitous, we're putting internet on all of the things, not just some of the things. So our human behavior has changed. We want information when we want it, the way we want it. And businesses are starting to shift to match the change in human behavior. If I have your information now, I want to do commerce with you now. The stakes are high. If you miss this, you might end up with this result. Since 2000, 52% of the Fortune 500 are no longer on the list. That's a big deal, right? Things are changing faster than they've ever changed before, and it's just not our imagination. If you follow Rita Hunter McGrath, a professor at the Columbia Business School, she's offered a frame of reference that says, we're at the end of competitive advantage. It used to be that the gold standard for business strategy was to establish mini monopolies, establish pricing power, customer control, and then exploit that for as long as possible to be able to generate your maximum profit. That no longer works. The companies that are falling off of the list can't keep up. So continuous innovation is the new frame. Continuous innovation is a response by business that the market is changing fast and they need to move faster. Now, we've seen this even in the not-for-profit space. You may have noticed. It's been a busy year. So, Six months ago, we started the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Um, that's why I have a job. Uh, about a month ago, we started the Open Container Initiative, and just on Tuesday, established the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So the first question is, why are there so many foundations? I think it's economics, right? Open source has won. Popular projects are now economically attractive, right? So this breeds competition and distrust, as opposed to what we used to do, which is share code, improve it, build it for reputation's sake. Now there's a model where venture capitalists are able to see this open source technology is really caught on. It's growing fast. So there's a simple model. Wrap a company around it, gather a set of investors, make sure you put money in, hire all of the maintainers, incent everyone with stock options, and try to become a unicorn, right? Where's my billion dollar valuation? Turns out with all of that money, you start to generate distrust. So some of the old nature of the open source model is starting to break down as these projects get bigger and more valuable. I think that's where foundations come in. The move to multi-vendor open source, right, creating a place to put this all in the commons, it enables these competing corporations to collaborate. So a few specific examples. So Pivotal Cloud Foundry established in 2011, building systems for cloud app native applications, was discovered by IBM. They wanted to put it in Bluemix. HP wanted to put it in the Helion. However, there's tensions. Why would I contribute to this when I'm signing over the copyright to a competitor? Right? The contributor license agreement owned by a for-profit company that you're going to be competing with, that's pretty hard. That's single vendor open source. So they came together last year, said let's create a foundation around it. So we're opening the development roadmap and we're standardizing through certification. This is the purpose of that foundation. Right? So you can find out more information here. Next example is Docker. As we all know, Docker has taken over the world. Right? Amazing success, breakout growth, breakout utilization. One of the side effects of success is there will be multiple opinions, right? And as you have more and more pull requests, you can't respond to all of them. So we end up with competition. Sometimes, sometimes this competition is great for innovation. Sometimes it starts to get destructive. We started seeing large companies asking themselves, what should I use? We're going to do a nine-month project to figure out which container technology we're going to use. That doesn't sound fast, right? That doesn't deliver on anything that we're trying to build here. So you take a foundation and create a project that allows the collaboration. So Docker and Rocket have now met in the Open Container Initiative. So what's that doing? It's standardizing the file format. It's standardizing the runtime. So we take previously warring standards, right? Docker file and AppC, create one common approach to file systems for containers. You take libcontainer and grow it up into runc. This is shocking. Not only are all of the competitors work using this, but Microsoft has now said that Run C is going to be the standard interface for Windows containers, and they're going to effectively implement Linux-type features to be able to support the requirements of Run C. 
So all of this stuff is starting to come together in this neutral ground, and it's going to make everything simpler for all of us. We can share our innovation. So for more information, you can look here. Um, probably everybody knows this logo as well. So Kubernetes had incredible growth, right, doing container orchestration. But it's confusing to understand what's happening. It started looking like it was Kubernetes versus all the container orchestration. People are trying to make sense of that. You think nine months is a long time to figure out which container you're going to use. It's probably going to take years for people to figure out what orchestration they're going to use across a Fortune 500 company. So if we can start to bring it together and say, well, what if it was Kubernetes and all the container orchestration, create the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, then we can work to harmonize Kubernetes and Mesos. We can reimagine schedulers as plugins. Talk a little bit more about that later. So, food for thought from Henrik Ingo. He did a study about uh, in, t in 2010, about five years ago. Um, fascinating study pointing to the same phenomenon. Uh, those of you who know me know I'm not a theorist, I'm an empiricist. I like to measure what's out there and report on that. And then Henrik did a very nice job here. He said there are nine projects Linux, KDE, Apache, Eclipse, Perl. Mozilla, GNOME, Drupal, and GNU that stand out as significantly larger, 10 times larger than any of the others. So all of these projects are governed by nonprofit foundations. He said no single vendor project has so far even been close to reaching their magnitude. So there appears to be a glass ceiling limiting the growth of the large single vendor projects. I suspect that this has something to do with the same economics and the trends that we're seeing right now. The second big question is how do all these technologies work together, or maybe why do they all work together? So any meaningful technology has a movement around it. Right? For Linux, the movement was open source. We now live in an age of open source. Open source is definitively one. Right? Each of these projects has logos that are as well known to you as logos from companies 20 years ago. It used to be that only large companies like Nike would have an internationally known logo. Everybody knows Docker. Everybody knows Linux. Everybody knows OpenStack. Maybe more interestingly, we live in an age of open source data centers. So we can stack all these things together, and we've got open source from the ground to the ceiling, right? from the compute uh, infrastructure all the way up to programming frameworks. So this is our opportunity. It's in our best interest to harmonize all of these. So if you're in the audience and you're a user, you should ask each of these projects to do a better job of interoperating and creating a harmonious stack. Right? It's our job to do that. But if open source is one, then what's the next movement? Right? Any meaningful technology has a movement around it. So for Cloud Foundry, the movement is continuous innovation. For Docker, the movement is continuous innovation. For Kubernetes, the movement is continuous innovation. Right? For CoreOS, for Mesos. Now, continuous innovation is an interesting word. It sounds a lot like what we deal with every day in technology. Right? We're building continuous integration. We're building continuous deployment. You'd be amazed at how many companies are using continuous integration, because that's almost obvious now. But when you ask them how long it takes you to deploy to production, they say, well, that's when we talk to IT. And so then you say, well, you don't actually have continuous deployment. So when you have a wonderful project that you can go demo to, or concept to demo in a month, but it still takes you three months to get into production, you're caught in a very particular anti-pattern. This is something that Dave West has coined. I think this term is quite powerful. <laughs> a lot of knowing laughter in the audience. So you know this pain. So we need to figure out collectively how to get out of this. Empirically, again, the solution is bringing dev and ops together, right? creating uh, one unified environment, one unified culture. It looks like microservices, containers, 12-factor applications. Uh, it's a world where everything is ephemeral. right? We can blow up containers. We can add containers. We can grow and shrink clusters. We're not particularly precious about any of the particular workloads. We know the workload exists en masse. No one instance is going to destroy us. That makes it scalable. Right? It also is about agility. Smaller pieces of code changing faster reduces our risk for any one change. When you think about the state of the art from five years ago, Zynga used to deploy to production 40 times a day. 40 times a day, right? That's like ludicrous speed. They've gone plaid. Uh, but as of, uh, as of last week, I think Amazon said that they now deploy to production on average every seven seconds. Right? So it's a different world. Um, why do we do it? We do it to run in the cloud. We do it to support any client device, because we're putting internet on all the things. You don't know what your devices will be next week, let alone next year. You need to connect to legacy data and processes via APIs. One of the interesting things in this trend is um, if you feel like the whole thing is a, it, it's all about building new things, and you forget your legacy, then you will join the 52% of the Fortune 500 who aren't on the list. 
Turns out those legacy systems actually still make you money. So like the Japanese did at Toyota in the 60s and 50s, right-sizing digital innovation means focusing on cycle time optimization. Don't build 50,000 bikes uh, per day. Tell me the talked time, end-to-end -end time for a single bike. Can you get one bike from end-to-end -end in 15 minutes? That's what you want to do, smaller teams and faster tools. There's some observations here, right? If you need more than two pieces to feed your entire team, you're probably too big, right? Is the silo getting in your way? So going back to some observations from Martin Fowler, who I can't believe that I'm standing on the same stage within roughly you know, a half an hour of, that's ridiculous. Um, Melvin Conway observes this, and then Martin follows up by looking at this and saying, well, when you start building really big teams and you've got a UI team and you've got a server-side logic team and you've got a database team, then you end up having effectively code politics. You need to move fast. It's too hard to coordinate. So you just put logic in all of the places. Oh, I couldn't push to production today, I just, um, but I do have access to the database, so I fixed it with a stored procedure. <laughs> Clearly, many people haven't tried to debug stored procedures in production. Um, so how do all these things work together? It comes back to solving this coherently, right? So we have this sort of sense of prescriptive versus assembled environments. Prescriptive environments are more for the Fortune 500 where they don't have time to assemble these things and you need stability in the infrastructure to continuously innovate in the business. On the other side, we need to have soft boundaries so we can continue to explore what's the nature of the cloud, right? What are the things that we need to use? What is the nature of uh, the modularity of these components? So there are a number of examples of prescriptive, right? Tectonic uh, from CoreOS, OpenShift from Red Hat, Cloud Foundry from many vendors. But then I'm asked, what's the difference between Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes? I say, wow, right? It's like comparing apples to dinosaurs. I don't know where to start. You have to start by peeling back the onion, saying, oh, well, actually, Kubernetes and Diego are both schedulers. How could they work together, right? Could Diego run on Mesos as an application workload scheduler? With foundations and with a warm sense of how we can interoperate, we can start to make the boundaries softer. It's already changed the Cloud Foundry roadmap. Now that Run C is out, we can stop building as much capability in Cloud Foundry-specific containers and join the Run-C movement, contribute some of our code and our uh, advances around security and manageability into the commons, right? We can share it all. So that said, what's happening with Cloud Foundry? So for those of you who have seen it but don't know what it does, two simple purposes. Enable continuous deployment of app cloud-native apps at scale and run in multiple clouds. So the inspiration of running in multiple clouds is to maybe sh make sure that we can continue to protect the freedom of users to move from cloud to cloud. Right now, moving from cloud to cloud is difficult. Five years from now, 20 years from now, when your code is in still, still in production, are your cloud providers still going to be there? Will they still have that interest, or will it have passed on? I don't know. But by then, when we talk about legacy in Fortune 500, everything we're building today is going to be legacy. This will be an issue that we're trying to solve up, up front. Cloud Foundry is running in a lot of different technologies, right? It's the infrastructure for Pivotal, IBM Bluemix, HP Helion, um, public offerings from SAP and HANA, CenturyLink, Accenture, Verizon, Huawei, ActiveState. It's very widely distributed. It's also widely adopted, but here's my favorite slide. It's about rebalancing everything towards the users, right? right? Like Tron, you have to fight for the users because otherwise the vendors will get you. So we're rebalancing the roadmap towards user-driven, or we're rebalancing the system towards user-driven roadmaps and control of the upstream project. Uh, and specific industries, right, in financial services, industrial IoT, telecommunications, we're building specific capabilities. We're learning a ton about moving a project from single vendor open source to multi-vendor open source, right? Explicit controls, implicit controls. Explicit controls are who has access to the code. Implicit controls are boy, do I really have standing to talk about that thing in the roadmap? Am I going to get listened to? Right? Transparency. When you're doing all your development in one room, you think you're being transparent, but there's a world outside that needs to be communicated with. So we're focusing going forward on certification to guarantee portability of apps across clouds because you need to be able to run your code everywhere. We need to make it lasting and durable because people will use these for 20 years. And we need to build the ecosystem of opportunity. So in closing, I'd say that we see a world of cloud computing that is ubiquitous and flexible. So you can mo move your workloads, portable and interoperable, so the applications can land, on, land in new places in the future. And something that is vibrant and growing that, under, that underlies a massive ecosystem of apps and developers. I'll close on one final note, and I'm over time, and I do apologize for that. But, uh, sorry, can we go back one slide? Um, 
but I think it's important for all of us to recognize that we see a human community here, right? We're not just faces, uh, we're not just names, we're not just email addresses. We see a human community that is pragmatic, right? It's focused on exchanging practical experience, not arguing about theory, right? That's diverse and inclusive of people across race, gender, orientation, and lifestyle. And finally, that's respectful and committed to listening to thoughtful and honest perspectives. What we've learned, what we believe, is that there is something to be learned from the quietest voice in the room. So with that, say thank you. Enjoy the conference.